This is the video for the higher level content from D1.2 on protein synthesis. Just like with replication, transcription and translation can only happen in a five prime to three prime direction. So let's blow up this picture of transcription for a moment, shall we? What we'll see is that the five prime end and the three prime end of the RNA molecule are situated to where the growing end of mRNA is the three prime end. New RNA nucleotides can only be added to that three prime end. That directionality of five prime to three prime also applies to translation. In translation, the ribosome is going to move in this direction from the five prime end of the mRNA to the three prime end of the mRNA. Transcription and translation produce proteins, and proteins are coded for by genes. Genes, again, are segments of DNA that code for a specific protein. At the beginning of a gene, we will find a short segment of base sequences called the promoter. So this serves as a binding site for either RNA polymerase or other factors that control transcription. This is again at the beginning of the gene. So if transcription were going to take place, then RNA polymerase would bind here and start using the antisense strand as a template for transcription. Transcription factors are proteins that can regulate genetic expression. And the way that they do that is they bind to the promoter. So I'll do these in blue and the promoter in yellow. These transcription factors are molecules that are gonna regulate transcription by either promoting transcription, like saying, hey, let's transcribe this gene, or inhibiting it. And so it can inhibit transcription by preventing RNA polymerase from binding. So these again are called transcription factors. The promoter itself does not get transcribed. Again, it's just the starting point. And it's also a great example of a non-coding region. So non-coding means that it does not code for a polypeptide and therefore is not a gene genes code for polypeptides. We have lots of base sequences. In fact, most of our base sequences in our genome are not genes. They are non-coding regions, base sequences that code for something else. And this might include base sequences for how to produce tRNA or rRNA. Even though those are important, they are not polypeptides. This could include those promoters. Again, they don't get transcribed. The telomeres, telomeres are these very cool pieces of structural DNA at the ends of chromosomes. So chromosomes kind of look like this, right? Um, in their replicated form, you might be more, I don't know, you might recognize them more in the replicated form, this classic X shape. Telomeres, and let's do them in, let's say, green. Telomeres are like these little caps at the end of a chromosome, okay? And those telomeres are structural DNA that prevents damage, especially during like mitosis. And then introns. Introns do not get translated into a polypeptide. They're actually edited out after transcription. And keep your eye on that one. We'll go into more detail here in a bit. Let's take a look at this prokaryote. In this prokaryote, transcription and translation are actually happening simultaneously. So as that mRNA is being synthesized, the part that's already built is getting translated by the ribosomes. This is super efficient, but it does not allow for post-transcriptional modification. So remember, transcription is going to produce mRNA. In post-transcriptional modification, we will modify that mRNA. And this can only happen in eukaryotes because eukaryotes are compartmentalized. That means that there is a nucleus separating the area where transcription is happening and the area where translation is happening out here in the cytoplasm on the ribosomes. Now, why do we care? 
because editing that mRNA allows us to make lots of different versions of a protein using the same gene. Let's use the alphabet as an example here. So let's say I have all the letters of the alphabet and I cut out all of the letters except for C, O, and W, okay? So I have just spelled the word cow. I can take the exact same sequence of letters, the exact same alphabet, and by eliminating a different combination of letters, I can make an entirely different word. And I can continue this pattern in this example. I could even, I've just been making three letter words. You could even make words of different lengths. So again, much like this alphabet, when we take mRNA and we cut out different sections, we can make different versions of that mRNA, which will be translated into different amino acid sequences, even though they were all transcribed from the same gene. So the mRNA that is made from transcription contains both exons and introns. Introns are going to be removed before this mRNA leaves the nucleus to be translated. So just like we were removing letters of the alphabet, these introns are also going to be removed. They are edited out of that mRNA and the exons are spliced together. So this is an important um, bit here. Again, if you take out different introns, you're going to create a very different sequence. Okay, so introns, I know this is hard. It sounds like introns should stay in the mRNA, but don't think of it like that. Think of it as this mRNA eventually wants to exit the nucleus and only the exons can exit with it. The introns, womp womp, they get cut out and they have to stay in the nucleus. That's how I think of it. So once that splicing has taken place, we're also going to see the addition of a five prime cap. This is going to help protect the mRNA as it's moving through the nucleus and a poly A tail. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's this very long string of nucleotides that all have adenine as their um, nitrogenous base. This can vary in length. So I often won't actually draw it like that. I will just say that it is a poly A tail. So A meaning adenine, poly meaning many, so our poly A tail will go on the three prime end of our mRNA molecule. And this is what we now call mature mRNA. So mature mRNA is splicing out those exons, um, adding, sorry, <laughs> getting rid of those introns, splicing together the exons, adding that five prime cap and the poly A tail. And again, if you remove different introns, then you're going to end up with different sequences in your mature mRNA. And this is called alternative splicing. Okay, it allows you to produce different versions of a protein all from the same gene because you edited the mRNA in different ways. All right, and so we see this a lot in how um, cells make different antibodies, and there are lots of applications here, all resulting in a wide variety of polypeptides or proteins being able to um, be synthesized from a single gene. Now that we've added a bit more detail to the process of transcription, let's do the same with translation. In the standard level portion of this topic, you learned that tRNA molecules bring their amino acids to the ribosome, right? They're transferring that amino acid. But we need to have a good understanding of how that tRNA attaches to its amino acid in the first place. And this is all due to an enzyme called the tRNA activating enzyme. You are allowed to call it by that name. However, you will also notice that some sources call it the aminoacyl tRNA synthetase enzyme. 
Don't be afraid of that. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is an enzyme that is going to attach an amino acid to a tRNA molecule. So it attaches the correct amino acid. You will notice that there is a different tRNA activating enzyme for each amino acid. Here is the one that is specific to the amino acid called methionine. When the tRNA activating enzyme attaches this amino acid to the tRNA, this is going to require ATP. So let's take a more simplistic view. tRNA, like all RNA molecules, is single-stranded. It's just kind of looped in on itself, but it's still one strand. And just like any other nucleotide, it has a five prime end and a three prime end. And just like nucleotides, amino acids can only attach to the three prime end. So we need this amino acid to attach up here to the tRNA molecule. Now I can redraw this line here, we like this. We need that attachment to take place, but that's going to require two things. It's going to require that tRNA activating enzyme and it will require ATP. So the amino acid, ATP, and the tRNA will all sit in on the active sites of this enzyme, and the enzyme will catalyze the reaction that results in the attachment of the amino acid, and it will cleave these phosphate groups from the ATP in order to get the energy it needs to make that attachment. When the amino acid is attached, we say that the tRNA is activated. You may also see it written as charged. It doesn't mean charge is in positive or negative. It just means it's ready. It's activated. It has the amino acid attached. Once that tRNA activation has happened, we can begin translation in earnest. So the tRNA carrying methionine is going to attach to the small subunit of the ribosome. Methionine corresponds to the start codon. It will always be the first amino acid in that chain. That small subunit of the ribosome that again has this tRNA is going to slide down the mRNA molecule until that complementary anticodon is attached to the codon on mRNA. So we have a start codon reading AUG, and once it finds that complementary anticodon, the ribosome will stop right there. At that point, the ribosome will finish assembling by adding the large subunit. So the large subunit of the ribosome will bind with the small one, and we are now ready to begin. Notice for this first tRNA, it's sitting not in the A site, but the P site. Okay, so that will be important, but this is how translation begins, and we call this phase initiation. And you already know the rest of the story from the standard level content. Again, then the next tRNA will bind with the A site. We'll get a transferring of this polypeptide chain through the synthesis of a peptide bond. And this cycle will repeat again, moving down the mRNA in a five prime to three prime direction until a stop codon is reached. So far in this video, we've talked about more details in transcription, more details in translation, and now we're going to look at what happens to these polypeptides after they've been translated. A polypeptide becomes a protein when it is modified and folded into its final functional shape. And this can include lots of different things. It could include the removal of that methionine or even whole sections of amino acids, which we'll look at in a moment. It could entail the modification of some of the R groups on the amino acids, folding into tertiary structure, or creating quaternary structure by combining with other polypeptides. We see that here in this example of hemoglobin, right, where I have one, two, three, four polypeptides combined together, or we could add non-polypeptide components, um, and that's a process called conjugation, so like I see these heme groups here, 
There's a whole other topic on proteins, which I suggest you take um, a look at if you wanna know more about things like tertiary structure um, or folding into functional shapes. The production of insulin is a great example of modification of polypeptides into their functional state. Now, insulin is a polypeptide hormone produced by the beta cells of the pancreas, but when it's first translated, it's we don't call it insulin. It's pre-proinsulin, and it's not insulin until it is modified. The insulin gene actually codes for 110 amino acids, and you can see them here in this chain. In the modification procedure, the rough ER is going to remove 24 amino acids, okay? And this is going to form pro-insulin. So we rev we've removed this, poly this part of the polypeptide. It then folds into tertiary structure by forming disulfide bonds, okay? So these are our group interactions, and so this change is going to fold into a three-dimensional structure. Some amino acids are going to be removed from the middle. So these amino acids here are going to be edited out, okay? And we're going to be left with two linked chains. So these two right here. Mature insulin has these two chains held together by the disulfide bridges, and now we're left with only 51 amino acids. So we've covered two of those modification steps, removal of some of the amino acids and folding into tertiary structure, and this is how you get mature insulin. Proteins do not tend to last very long inside of cells. They're very quickly transformed. Either they're denatured and we need to make a new one or they're just not needed anymore. And so they need to kind of get recycled. And for that, we rely on a structure called a proteasome. Proteasomes are an enzyme complex that are going to take proteins and break them into short polypeptides. Okay, so these shorter polypeptides can then be further broken down into individual amino acids. And then what's really cool is they get recycled, right? Because when the cell needs to build a different protein, it needs those amino acids. So we're taking small amino acids, putting them together to make a functional protein. When we're done with that protein, we take them apart, we create amino acids again, and it all cycles through. Of course, like anything else in biology, this requires enzymes and ATP. So we wanna keep our eye on that. Um, um, and that'll conclude this video on protein synthesis.